while people are getting settled, um, let me just make a couple of announcements and then I'll um, introduce our speakers. I'm Steve Jaffe. I'm uh, Chief of the Division of Medical Ethics and with Holly Fernandez Lynch, who's out of town, uh, have been co-hosting these Research Ethics and Policy Series uh, seminars. Um, the, first of all, I want to uh, thank our sponsors for the um, seminars. As you can see up here, in addition to our Department of Medical Ethics and Health Policy, the Office of uh, Clinical Research at the uh, School of Medicine, uh, the Abramson Cancer Center, uh, ITMAP, ITMAP and uh, CHOP, all of whom have contributed to making this possible. So thanks to all of them. Uh, we are now, after today, going to go on hiatus for the summer. Uh, and then we'll be back actually in October. Because we do these on the first Monday, on the first Monday of September is Labor Day, um, there will not be a September session. So a uh, great lineup for the fall, uh, October 7th, the first Monday in October, Jonathan Moreno on uh, gene editing and geopolitics. Uh, November 4th, uh, Greg Gonsalves, who's going to come down from Yale, uh, who's a faculty member there, but among other things is one of the foremost uh, HIV patient advocates in the world is going to come down and likely, although I don't have his title, be talking about uh, patient participation in research advocacy. Uh, and then Holly in December will talk about evaluating IRB uh, effectiveness. Obviously, if you're on, are on the mailing list, you'll be getting notices about those, uh, and please continue to come. Uh, really a pleasure uh, for today to introduce my friend uh, Neil Dickert. Uh, Neil is an assistant professor of medicine and in the Division of Cardiology at Emory in Atlanta. Um, he also uh, has an appointment in uh, epidemiology at the School of Public Health there at Emory. Um, he also does a clinical work at the VA uh, in Atlanta. Uh, he's a board-certified uh, cardiologist. His clinical work is in cardiac clinical care, critical care, uh, and in echocardiography. Um, this, by the way, is Hopkins comes to Penn Day um, because uh, he did his um, uh, both medical school and his PhD in health policy and bioethics uh, at Johns Hopkins. Uh, and then his internal medicine residency there and his cardiology fellowship at Emory. Uh, and he wor he's worked on many things uh, in uh, research ethics. Uh, one of the primary things that he's worked on is the ethical challenges when doing clinical research where informed consent is either totally impossible or very difficult to achieve. And that's what he's going to be talking about today. Um, but then uh, after Neil finishes, uh, it will also be a pleasure to hear from Ben Abella, who's one of uh, the faculty members uh, here at Penn. Uh, ben is Vice Chair for Research and Professor in the Department of Emergency Medicine, uh, serves as Director of the Center for Resuscitation Science, uh, focuses on cardiac arrest and emergency resuscitation care, and you can imagine that those are not exactly situations where informed consent is easy to obtain. Um, and I say it's Hopkins Day because uh, Ben also went to medical school at Hopkins, uh, but he did his uh, medicine residency and his internal medicine and his emergency medicine training um, at the University of Chicago. Uh, and he's been here on the faculty since 2006. So I'll turn the podium over to Neil and then uh, Ben to you, and we'll uh, look forward to time for the talks and for discussion from you all. Great. Thanks so much, Steve, for the nice introduction and for the invitation to be here. Um, this is a really nice place for me to visit um, a lot of some friends and colleagues over, uh, over many years. Uh, and so it's great to, great to be here and great to talk with you all about some of the work um, that I've been uh, doing in this space. And really nice also to have Ben uh, comment on this. Ben and I are old friends, having met randomly on a street in Paris a month ago. Um, and, uh, and, and, and he clearly is, uh, probably needs no introduction, but a leader in this space. And so his thoughts on, on my work is really a nice uh, privilege for me. So I have no disclosures um, uh, other than research funding, most of which is what the talk is going to focus on. Right, so doing clinical trials in patients who are having a cardiac arrest is a pretty straightforward process. You have a nice conversation with a patient about this very exciting study you'd like to talk to them about. You pause for a few minutes to go get a consent form. You have the patient sign. Right, this is obviously not the way things go. A lot of the attention on research in emergency settings has happened in patients like that. Right? These are tough situations, but they're pretty clear sets of options. Right? If a patient is having an arrest or they're unconscious for some other reason and decisions have to be made immediately, consent just isn't possible. Um, and we have a choice about whether we do clinical trials in these situations or we don't. There's not a lot of uh, choices about how to involve people. There are regulations that exist to try to, um, uh, to facilitate uh, ethical research in these situations, and I won't go through all of the requirements for the exception from informed consent regulations, 
um, but they're relatively well known. There's certainly some challenges in working with them, specifically with regard to the community consultation and public disclosure piece um, that have been well described. Um, but there is at least a clear pathway for how we go about doing this. It doesn't always play well, right? So this is a, a really nice example of a, uh, one of my favorite uh, titles um, that Chuck Grassley decided to write, uh, that Americans shouldn't be on game shows in U.S. emergency rooms and ambulances. That's what Ben does. He does game shows. Um, so not always go well in the court of public opinion, and it can be challenging figuring out how best to communicate about this. But a lot of the pieces of how to do research in emergency situations like this have been worked out. This guy is a guy I take care of a lot, right? For those of you who are non-medically trained, the guy's having a heart attack. Um, he is, uh, he's sick. He can talk to you. He can tell you what's going on. He can tell you his chest hurts. He can tell you he can't breathe. Um, and then so you decide to talk to him about the trial that you'd like to involve him in. Right? This is probably not the first uh, interaction that you might have. Sure, I'd love to have a nice conversation with you about the Am I Tough trial. Probably as unlikely when you're talking with him as he's getting whisked off to the cath lab to go get his uh, artery open. He's probably not likely to say he'd like to hear a little bit more about how his information will be shared or to have a long talk about what alternatives he's got. So whereas I think in some ways the, the sort of cardiac arrest type situation poses a lot of challenge. It doesn't quite pose the thorny issues that a guy like this does when you think about enrolling him in a clinical trial. These are acutely ill patients. They require immediate treatment. If we're going to do clinical trials in this situation, it means we also require immediate enrollment decisions. They're high stakes situations, right? So these are ones where usually studies are looking at differences in either major morbidity or mortality. Um, there's a wide spectrum of ability um, to engage in consent processes uh, among patient populations that are, in, that are emergently ill. Um, and it's a real challenge about how we respect them in these situations. So this is probably not the answer to that, this patient's request. He doesn't want mountains of consent forms. Yet usually, when people get enrolled in trials like this, they tend to get consent forms that are 14, 15 pages long, just like they do in clinical trials in other contexts. So just to, just to sort of fill out the, the context a little bit more, it's important to recognize, I, I, maybe I don't know whether Ben agrees, but most emergency research actually falls into this category, right? There's a relatively narrow set of studies that fall in the exception from informed consent. Most studies in emergency and acute care context um, you know, pose some sorts of challenges. Wide range of conditions, right? Acute heart attack, stroke, sepsis, trauma. Happen pre-hospital, can be in the emergency department, can be in acute care, in ICUs, in ORs. There's a wide uh, range of uh, conditions and settings. <clears throat> so what I want to do is talk a little bit about um, what the nature of some of the barriers and limitations to involving people are in this context. Some of the data that we've tried to gather about patients' experiences of clinical trials in these spaces. Um, in particular, I'll talk about a study called PCARE that we, do, that we did. Um, and then talk a little bit about the regulatory, some of the regulatory challenges that, that remain. And touch at the end about maybe feeding back into the exception from informed consent context some of the questions that exist about how to involve people in that space. All right, so here's our friend again. Just to lay the groundwork so you have a, a, a situation that you can imagine. This is a guy who comes into the hospital. He's got uh, what's called an ST elevation MI. That's like the big one in... Uh, in non-medical speak. He needs to essentially be in the cath lab with his artery open, ideally within 90 minutes of the time he first came into contact with a medical provider. So including sort of time from the ER, getting to the ER, getting to the cath lab. A lot of things have to happen in that 90 minutes, right? So the barriers to consent in this kind of context are, are, some, are some are obvious, some are a little less straightforward, but it's clear they're present. Right? There's time pressures, which we discussed. Physical symptoms, which can range. Uh, in this particular case, it may be the short of breath. You may be having some chest pain. In more severe illness, they might have problems with cognition. Certainly stress. There may or may not be neurologic impairment. When you think about stroke trials, there's clearly neurologic impairment, and usually you're working with a surrogate. 
there's almost always a lack of familiarity of the research, right? This is not what they expected. This is not the decision they expected to make when they came into the emergency department that day. Um, and it's important to recognize that even when you're involving surrogates, which are usually our sort of go-to when patients are not in a position to make decisions themselves, the surrogates face most of these pressures too, right? The surrogate doesn't have any longer time frame. They're certainly stressed. The only thing they might not have is chest pain. Sometimes they have that too, and then they become the patient. In terms of whether the barriers materialize, there's not a huge set of data on this, but all the data essentially point towards something I think that most of us would recognize, that people often don't understand that much about what they sign up for in these acute settings. There's a study a while back of cardiologists. Um, this was in Europe. They essentially, more than half of people thought that patients only sometimes, almost never, or never know what they're accepting or refusing. Refusing some work in the stroke uh, and in, in the heart attack space, too. Also, after people enroll in many of these trials, show they don't have a great idea what, um, what they signed up for. Um, when they do remember signing up, often they have um, confusion about whether it was something that was principally a research intervention or whether it was something that was done purely for clinical benefit. And there are common patient surrogate discordance uh, in, in the stroke space. None of this is surprising. So many people, I think, would take the view that we should just forget this process altogether, right? We should abandon consent. And I have to say that when I first started thinking about a lot of these issues, that was sort of the idea I had, right? One reason is that it's pointless, right? There's no way it's meaningful. You know people aren't going to understand what they're signing up for when they're having a heart attack or having a stroke. I would have thought it's actually inhumane, right? It's kind of mean to make people think through something like this in the middle of one of the most stressful events of their life. You could argue it's bad for patients. They might make bad or inauthentic decisions under incomplete information. And you can certainly argue that it might be bad for science, particularly if it's the case that people are just saying no out of hand without even hearing um, what they're being asked to do. All of these arguments have been made. And recently, pro probably the most um, sort of uh, public way in which these arguments were hashed out in the cardiology space is there was a trial called heat PPCI. It was done without, uh, without prospective consent um, in Liverpool and randomized people to two common anticoagulation regimens, uh, bivalirudin and heparin, in the context of this ST elevation MI. Um, and it was done using, in Britain, they call it deferred consent, uh, but essentially done as an EVIC trial with STEMI patients. Um, and it got a lot of controversy. Many people and the people supporting HEAT, um, the way it was done, um, would w make the arguments that I mentioned already. But I think there's at least some reasons to think about why you'd even consider involving patients uh, in these sorts of circumstances. Right, so one is they're not always impaired. Right? A lot of people with heart attacks are perfectly able to have a conversation with you when you're interacting with them. Second, surrogates are often available in one form or another. The stakes are high. The decisions matter, right? These aren't simple decisions just about sort of what to eat when they're in the hospital. These are things that are looking at major outcomes. There are ways that we all know that research decisions are uh, fundamentally different um, from clinical decisions, at least in what they're directed to achieve. There, it's clear some people would want to say no. Um, and there are important considerations of transparency and trust that at least make you think about are there ways we should think about involving people in these kinds of decisions? From a regulatory perspective, this stuff exists in pretty much in a no man's land, right? Most of the time, these studies aren't considered to qualify for the exception from informed consent because there's somebody you can talk to. Um, but it's clearly not a normal context for making a pretty complex decisions. Uh, and it's unlikely to meet strict standards for informed consent that we might at least um, say we expect. Um, in a lot of other clinical trial situations. So a lot of what I've tried to do is figure out, well, what do people want out of this situation? Right? We can think about what we think makes sense, but um, it matters a lot what patients and surrogates who are, and really, they're supposed to be the users of the processes that we uh, put in place, what do they want out of consent in these kinds of uh, contexts? The traditional approaches, at least of kind of long forms, are, are really driven by a combination of sort of legal regulatory concerns, and quite frankly, just inertia, because that's just kind of the way we do research. But it's, it, you can easily imagine, at least if our goal is to sort of promote involvement, 
handing someone a 14-page consent form when they're on a cath lab table probably doesn't help, and you could argue may even make the process less productive. So I'll go through a handful of studies that, we've, um, that we did that I think uh, are interesting, and for me, were really informative in trying to, think, to, to understand what people's expectations were. So this is a very simple study we did of patients who had an incredibly small, but I think, in, I think has some important insights. We took people who had been admitted with a primary diagnosis of acute MI to the hospital and essentially asked them about three different trial scenarios. I won't go into the details about the scenarios, but just the sort of bare bones. Scenario one was essentially comparing two different common antiplatelet medicines. Um, very little known difference between the two. Scenario two was kind of an experimental med medicine that would potentially save more heart muscle versus placebo, all on top of standard care. And scenario three was medicine versus a procedure up front. So this was based on a trial called Shock 2 that was looking at a balloon pump, which is a way to sort of help the heart um, when it's not doing well, versus kind of starting with med medical therapy and then adding a balloon pump or other mechanisms if the patient wasn't doing well. So upfront procedure versus kind of procedure as bailout. The important thing here is really the first line, that when we asked, do you want to be asked for consent, you see sort of regardless of the trial type, people reflected that they would a preference for being asked for consent uh, before being in the study. But when you asked were you likely to say yes, if you look at the bottom line, which is the number of people who were unlikely or stated that they would be unlikely or very unlikely to enroll, these are hypothetical whether this would actually materialize, we don't know. But you do see people care about, they, they think differently about the different kinds of studies. They don't necessarily seem to think differently about whether they want to be asked. We did do a follow-up study after HEAT PPCI came out. We were curious, you know, in, in the general public in the U.S., what are the thoughts about a study like this? What would, you, what would you want to happen if you were kind of to come into the emergency department and be eligible with a heart attack? So we, we, used, um, we used a GFK knowledge panel, which is essentially an online uh, representative sample, and we took 2,000 people and divided them in half. Um, this slide's a little busy, so I'll, I'll, I'll sort of walk you through it. But the first half of people is group A. And in group A, we randomized people. Everybody kind of got a description of the scenario. Um, and then we randomized them to a choice as to whether they would want to be enrolled with traditional written consent versus something like the EFIC mechanism, where they were enrolled and then notified later. And you can see um, that there was... Um, uh, essentially kind of a wash between, uh, between uh, whether they wanted written consent or to be notified later. In group B, we asked them, would you rather have kind of like a brief verbal consent versus a traditional formal written consent? And you can see that support was substantially greater for the brief verbal consent versus the traditional written consent. Now, whether that's because of the brief part or the verbal part, this study wasn't really designed to, to, to sort that out. But you can see at least there's some general notion that a more context-specific approach seems to be uh, favored. What I think was really interesting is if you look among the people who, were, who stated they were unlikely to want to be a part of the trial, you see a, a, a pretty pronounced separation in group A, right? Those people who didn't want to uh, be in the trial, uh, three-quarters of them would prefer written consent to no involvement. But again, they, they were still about 50-50 as to whether they preferred um, the sort of brief verbal process versus written consent. These are not definitive in any way. What I think this suggests is there's some notion that something more context-specific seems palatable and doesn't seem to be, particularly with the verbal consent idea, doesn't seem to be particularly problematic among the people you worry most about, um, who are the people who would not want to be part of the trial. So the PCARE study, um, and I always have to if, I, if only I were a urologist, it'd be a lot better to have this name of PCARE. Um, but at any rate, so this is the patient-centered uh, approaches to uh, research enrollment decisions in acute cardiovascular conditions. Uh, this is a study funded by PCORI that we are in the stages, uh, wrapping up stages right now. But the first part of this study involved doing w one of the largest interview studies of people who had actually been enrolled in STEMI trials. Uh, again, that's the acute heart attack and then acute stroke trials. So we talked to almost 200 people uh, in 11 different trials. Um, and then we worked with a nine-member patient panel to try to use those data and build consent processes based on what patients told us they care about. 
And then we're implementing those processes within a couple of trials, and I'll tell you a little bit about that. So first, some of the, the kind of interview data. Um, this shows just the, the, the extent to which people remembered or didn't remember being a part of these studies. Now, these, were, these uh, people were often interviewed a little while out, um, and that's important in terms of their recall especially. Um, but you can see that almost half of uh, the, uh, the folks that we talked to in the MI trials didn't really remember being a part of a study in an important way. Uh, in contrast, the stroke population, 80% of them were aware of it. It's importantly driven by the fact, I think, that um, the stroke population was about 85% surrogates because we talked to whoever made the decision, right? So it wasn't that we were talking to a surrogate. They, they were functioning as the primary person because they're the one who were making the decision. Um, in the MI population, we always talk to patients, right? Because in MI trials, it's very rare to use surrogate decision making. So that's an important uh, contextualization. With regard to kind of timelines for decisions, um, again, this is their recall. Um, but you can see that, you know, over 50% in both groups essentially remembered a conversation, uh, a description of less than 15 minutes. With the stroke group, you do have some conversations that lasted a little bit longer, and that's consistent with the patterns of um, at least the workflow for acute stroke and heart attack. But pretty quick, certainly, within the uh, acute MI population. Um, and then with regard to the decision to to decisions about whether to join the study, you can see the decisions were made very quickly. So this just shows sort of three questions that get at their attitudes towards the consent process. The first, pretty straightforwardly, were you glad you were asked, or I was glad I was asked before the patient or me uh, was included or being included um, in the trial. Um, and the rates of agreement with that were pretty high in both groups. Um, relatively few people, so less than 20% uh, in the stroke group, agreed that they wished they had not had to sign a consent form. Um, I was surprised by that. Um, in contrast, about 35% of the, po the population in the MI group um, wished that they had not had to sign a consent form. Um, and then in terms of whether they would have preferred an EFIC approach, we asked, instead of asking me before including me in the study, I would have preferred if the doctor treating me had made the decision for me. Uh, only 16% in the stroke group um, and uh, about a quarter in the heart attack group endorsed that approach. So again, a general preference for, um, for being involved in decisions about the study with a little less, um, little less enthusiasm for that among the MI population than the stroke group. These, I think, get at some interesting domains of this. So the first question, we were curious about whether anyone ever sort of came back to talk with them about what they were enrolled in. And this is, I think, uh, a finding that has some, um, some meaning in terms of practical implications. You can see that uh, a relatively high number of people um, had either didn't remember or felt like nobody ever came back to them to talk about the study in which they were enrolled. Now, again, this was their report, so I don't know that that's necessarily, you can't verify that that's necessarily true, but it does ring true when you think a lot of the time follow-up activities just talk about, they're just literally just doing the follow-up rather than re-engaging people in a discussion about kind of what the study was itself. We were very interested, and this is just one of the questions that we asked related to sort of domains of respect, um, but on almost all of them, um, and you can see here, the, in terms of being treated with dignity, very high rates of people feeling like they were treated appropriately, um, and the other domains that got at, at, at other sort of dimensions of at least our conceptual notion of what it is to be treated with respect, all of those were very high. Um, that was actually quite encouraging to me and a little bit surprising. In terms of whether they felt pressure um, to be included in the study, um, again, very low rates of feeling pressured to be in the study, which again, I was a bit surprised by, but encouraged um, that people's experiences are, are relatively positive. We did do a, a follow-up key informant study with this to, to uh, where we conducted um, semi-structured interviews and really sort of dug into people that had interesting, um, interesting answers to the first round and then made sure that we had talked to people that sort of fit in different kinds of categories in terms of either patient categories or response patterns in the primary um, interview and, and also asked them really in, you know, in much more depth, what, what sort of drove positive and negative experiences? Um, and these were really, uh, really interesting. So some are totally not surprising. So many of, uh, as you might guess, many, uh, many individuals had 
uh, uh, responses that were driven by the sort of nature of the interpersonal interaction that they had with people. Um, it's not something we often think about, um, but it's pretty obvious for anyone who has clinical relationships with patients that how you kind of comport yourself, how you behave, will make a big difference in people's experience of care. Um, that goes uh, for research as well. So things like uh, making them feel like more than a number. Uh, you know, they took the time to let you know you, you weren't just something that they were learning from. You were somebody to them. Uh, professional behaviors, often that um, didn't really specifically isolate to the research practice, but feeling like they were being taken care of by someone who was being highly professional made them feel more comfortable about um, the process of agreeing to be in a research study. Um, and then non-pressuring uh, uh, behaviors, we do have a good example here of something that wasn't so hot, uh, right? I remember just saying, just go away, please leave me alone. And then he said, if you just sign here, we can proceed and I won't bother you anymore. Um, but at that time, I felt beleaguered, um, so that just added to my stress at the time. Um, so we did have some examples of kind of what drove negative experiences as well. For me, one of the most surprising domains of all of this um, has been people's attitudes towards consent forms. Again, I really thought people were going to be really pretty ticked off uh, at the idea of having to sign a form in a circumstance where they knew they didn't know what they were signing up for. Turns out people have all sorts of attitudes towards forms, and I probably should have known that going in. We had some people who felt like the form was a sign that the study was legitimate or above board. Um, this, this quote is from someone who was military. She, she said, I'm military, very detail-oriented, you know, for action. There needs to be something signed to say it happened or why it happened, so that's the norm. She felt like that was just sort of protocol. We had other people that said, look, that's a sign that's been approved. It's above board. Somebody, somebody's not trying to hoodwink me. Um, other people, you know, we didn't have many. There were, there were I think, only two examples like this that, where they felt like the act of signing sort of really was giving consent for this to take place. It made me feel like I was part of what was actually going on. Um, we had some folks who, not surprisingly, felt like it was a, uh, that it was a bit annoying. Um, some people that didn't have their glasses or other kinds of things that made it very difficult in this acute setting. It's kind of a moot point to have a signature, and it was distressing at the time because I couldn't see. I couldn't read what it said, and I certainly wasn't listening to what it said. So that's not surprising to get that. We did have some people uh, come up with very creative answers. One person said it would help to protect the hospital if their crazy family member decided to sue, um, which was very interesting. Um, and then people stated that they hoped that it might, be, that they thought um, it might be a useful resource to refer to later, um, which is something that I think is not usually what consent forms are designed to be, but it's a function that it may play. So in terms of kind of implications of what we found through the series of studies, we found I think, importantly, that people do want to be involved in decisions and that their desire to be involved in decisions doesn't hinge on how much they understand at the time. Uh, I do think at a really practical level, there's probably greater potential for involvement in, a, in the stroke context because you have a little different interaction, a little more time with a surrogate than you do with a patient having a heart attack. For me, the, the, the key, though, is that there are ways that the consent process has value even when barriers exist. But I think it's important to recognize the, the role it's playing is very different. Um, <clears throat> it clearly does give people an opportunity to say no, so it gives them control over what happens. It certainly felt, uh, or it certainly can help to tell people what's happening, and many people did sort of mention the importance of feeling like people weren't trying to hide things, um, so the transparency function is real. Um, there's concrete ways in which I think it helps people to feel respected as a person, um, uh, because that's just when we, you know, the expectation when we're going to do something is we ask. Um, but I think it's really important to recognize, it should be very clear, I think, from the thread that you can, uh, from, from, from the quotes I've, I've mentioned and also people's level of understanding, it's really hard to argue that they're signing the form does anything to kind of authorize the risk that we're imposing. Um, and they're not really, it's probably not a very robust practice of helping them to really protect their own uh, welfare interests. Um, so the consent process isn't doing some things that it might be doing in other settings. Um, and then, as we've discussed, I think it's clear they have relatively minimal understanding and highly variable views about what the form itself does. So the next step of that study was to work with this patient group um, to try to sort of create materials that we thought would be helpful in a process that we thought would be helpful um, in these trials. And this, I have to say, has been a really um, significant sort of silver lining for me. It's the first time I've ever done a study like this, or done a project like this where uh, 
where I've kind of really partnered with a group of, uh, of patients to try to let them drive the process and try to create something that would be useful. Um, we worked with a, really a great group of people that, that were um, uh, patients who had had acute, heart, acute MI, patients who had had stroke, some patients who were surrogates, um, and a, a couple of folks from our patient family advisory group a handful, as of, of the nine, I think four had actually experienced making a clinical trial enrollment decision, several in the acute stroke context with the person for whom they were a surrogate. Um, and, and we worked with them, uh, we met roughly quarterly over about a three to four year period. Um, and in terms of the, the, the process that we developed um, for these studies, um, there are really three components. One is a short, simple form that would be usable in real time. That's not rocket science, but they did feel like if you're going to hand us some, you're going to hand somebody a, some pieces of paper. In theory, they should be able to read it during the time frame where they have to make a decision, even if they don't. Um, a separate information sheet that would serve as a resource that was directed totally to be a resource later, not something to help them make a decision at the time, uh, and an opportunity for follow-up contact, just so that you re-interface with people. Um, and give them a chance to, um, to ask questions. This is a website, um, and I'd be happy to provide that if the slides aren't uh, otherwise available, um, where we have sample forms for, for six different trials that the group worked with. I'll give you some examples in just a second from one of them. In terms of the, the kind of consent form and, and, and content, the, the approach really is, again, it's not rocket science, but I think it really was helpful for us to have this driven from their sets of concerns. So one, I mentioned it already, they did feel like it should be realistic, right? It isn't helpful to give somebody pieces of paper that you know they can't read. Uh, second, to eliminate, eliminate or minimize extraneous information, and we worked very hard on that, um, to take out elements of care that aren't uh, a part of the research, because that is almost always a large part of consent forms. Um, sometimes that was even, I would say, we, we pushed the boundaries on, on one or two of those where if there was a separate surgical consent form, for example, and it was not a blinded study, we relied on some of the things like anesthesia risks and those kinds of things that were going to be disclosed in the surgical consent only for the people who had been randomized to that treatment. Many of those uh, issues were only discussed in the, in the surgical consent and they were, ran they were, they were just referenced um, in the regular consent. That actually came from several patients' experiences of saying they felt like when they made an enrollment decision, they made this gut-wrenching sort of decision to decide to have this surgery done, including all the sort of detailed elements of anesthesia rest, other kinds of things. And then, you know, you get randomized to control and you don't have it done. They said, why, you know, why, why don't you do the randomization, Let, you know, get my, get my authorization to do the randomization first, then go through the details later. Um, at the time when I'm actually making that decision. So we tried to, there's a lot of studies you can't operationalize something that, like that, but we tried, to, we tried to do that where possible. I think that's a really interesting um, a process for uh, uh, a lot of clinical trials. Our group became interestingly a bit fixated at times on the sort of notion that first impressions matter. Right? They sort of viewed the first page of a consent form as like boardwalk and park place, and yet it's cluttered with junk. Um, they really got mad at the fact that there were long titles they couldn't understand, sponsors' names they didn't care about, all these investigators listed they couldn't care less about, and then generic descriptions about what it is to be in a research study, which if you look at most, most boilerplate consent forms, that's what's there. Um, they felt like, look, we don't have a lot of time. What you need to do is to tell us what we're being asked early uh, and only focus on things that matter. Uh, certainly don't use the most high-value uh, space in a consent form for the least valuable information. We, um, they felt very strongly that a lot of the negative valence in consent forms was problematic, um, particularly with regard to benefits language, and I'll give you an example of way, the ways they changed that in just a second. Um, and as I mentioned, they felt like the information sheet um, would be a really important adjunct, and it shouldn't be written as part of the consent form. You need to think about what information serves what function um, at what point in the study. So we are implementing this within two studies. Um, one is the ENRICH study, which is the early minimally invasive surgical evacuation versus conservative management in intracerebral hemorrhage. Um, we implemented that at seven sites. The process of getting our novel consent form approved at three of those can only be described as maddening. Um, and it didn't happen in a few cases. One, of, one IRB told us the problem is this is, a, this is not a minimal risk study, so it's just too short. It needs to be longer. So they actually 
took old language from the consent form, just put it in, and made the form longer. We had a conversation with them at one point. They said, yeah, we realized that probably didn't make sense, did it? And I'm like, no, 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 I don't think so. Um, so it's very interesting to try to, to, try to do that. Uh, we are uh, now have undertaken uh, doing this within the MOST trial, which is being done within StrokeNet, interestingly, which is being done through a central IRB. Um, and that form is now being rolled out at over 100 sites around the country. And, and actually, as a side point, is a really interesting advantage of using a central IRB in terms of being able to be a, a, a way to facilitate innovation and consent. So really briefly, the consent form that we have for Enrich is three pages of content versus seven, plus some other garbage that was in the initial one. Um, has very straightforward language. We talked about um, um, uh, some of the fact that we, uh, uh, what we didn't include with regard to the things that were on the surgical consent. We had, um, we tried to order it, this was also important to the panel, to order it in a way that followed the conversation so people could conceivably read it as you're having a discussion with them. Um, and the panel actually felt like maybe it would give some investigators or coordinators some guidance about how to talk about different domains, um, especially because it's phrased um, in terms of questions that people might actually ask. This is an example of the way that the benefits language was changed in this. Um, this is not earth-shattering changes, but I think it's really interesting, particularly when you look at how much pushback we got for this change. So the previous version was the standard, right? This study is not designed to benefit you directly. Your condition may improve while you're in the study, but it may not. It may even get worse. The results from the study will help people with ICH in the future. No guarantee you'll receive any benefit. Just in case you didn't get that from the first line, you get that from the last. Right, so that, that's, our patient said, look, that doesn't tell us anything about why you would enroll in the study. Like, you're depriving us of a piece of information that's actually valuable. So we tried to reword it in a way that, again, it's not, earth shattering, but I think they felt like was more honest. It's possible removing blood with early surgery, very early surgery may reduce disability or impairment from the bleeding stroke. It's also possible that very early surgery will be no better or not as good as standard medical treatment alone. The risks are described in the risk section too. We didn't leave that out. Either way, the knowledge gained from the study will help doctors to know more about treatments that are most effective for a bleeding stroke. The, the point of this was it was just an attempt to try to just be honest. Um, and patients seem to really value that. Uh, this just sort of goes through the, the main outcome that we're looking at in all of these studies is people's experience of consent, but we are also looking at impacts on rate of enrollment, um, the experiences of teams, and I can say investigators and coordinators um, really like the idea of having something that they feel honest about rather than handing, something, handing someone uh, a piece of paper that they know they couldn't possibly read. Um, and, and the IRB process, as, uh, as I mentioned. In the most study in particular, that's really helpful because we're having we, we'll do a sub-study in which all of the, or a good chunk of the um, IRBs who have to actually, the local IRBs who have to see what they are now um, asked to approve from the central IRB. We're looking at modifications that are made, requests, and those kinds of things to see where people are actually um, focused. So uh, in conclusion, um, I'll say just a couple of quick things with regard to where this leaves us. So one is in the regulatory challenge space, right? As I mentioned, there's really only two ways to do research in emergency setting. Either it's using the EFIC pathway or full informed consent, and there's really not a lot of provisions that um, uh, effectively make it okay to do context-specific um, approaches, despite the fact that that seems to be what meets patients' needs. And implementation of that will really depend on a good relationship with IRBs. Um, it is important to note that the EFIC process can incorporate an opt-out or assent process, and there have been a couple of studies that have done that, particularly in the pre-hospital setting. Um, with, uh, there was one with in, in pre-hospital, people who were suspected of having a heart attack where they had you know, a three or four line opt-out. You know, you, do you not want to be a part of this study that's testing a new, uh, a new drug for heart attack? And then we'll talk about it more later, but if you don't want to be in it, you know, it's off the table. It's an interesting approach that hasn't really been looked at. Um, but it's thoughtful, I think, in terms of trying to be context-specific. There is one thing, as I mentioned, we'd come back to the EFIC space, um, and, and maybe it's something I, I figured I would sort of throw this out there as something that uh, might be interesting to think about uh, with you guys. But, you know, EFIC trials are heterogeneous too, right? There's different timelines and different kinds of conditions. The regulations have a provision that state that people are supposed to have an opportunity to object when, uh, you know, when possible. It's not really defined what possible is. It's defined, it's, separate, it's a separate requirement from consent. 
But this is essentially if there's somebody who maybe isn't an official LAR that's there with the patient, or if there's somebody you've got on the phone who you can't really have a consent conversation. The, the spirit of the regulations, I think, is in theory you ought to give those people an opportunity to say no. You can imagine that is really complicated to try to operationalize. Um, and I think it's a really, the really important ethical question is how hard should we work to try to avoid uninformed refusals? And we've done a little work on this, but I think it's an area where there's a lot more to work on. Um, I, I personally think there are pretty strong reasons to, to try to give people opportunities to object where we can. Um, and I'm not that worried about people saying no to research studies when it's the case that standard therapy is okay. Um, so it's not the same thing because the default is enrollment. If you flip it, normally we don't require any sort of capacity to say no to a trial. Um, we require capacity to get into a trial. So in this kind of context, it seems to me logical that we wouldn't worry so much about people being, um, uh, being sort of shunted to standard care. Um, and I think the key criterion is, is really whether the assumption that the individual would not likely object to enrollment, whether that's undermined. That's a, a key uh, feature of the ethical justification of trials using exception from informed consent that Emily and colleagues have sort of articulated as one of the criteria. I think it's a really helpful one. Um, so the kind of test we would propose would be, is that undermined or not, right? I mean, if it's somebody who's like falling over drunk and said, you know, I don't want you to enroll someone and they can't even finish their sentence, that may not be someone who's truly engaging in any meaningful way. But there are a lot of times where I think, um, you know, if somebody is there and they suggest that they wouldn't want to be enrolled, it makes you really question whether this assumption is valid. So anyway, tons of practical challenges about how to work that out. But I wanted to mention that the, the, the notion of sort of partial involvement is a meaningful question, an important question at a practical level for EFIC studies too. All right, so in summary, I've tried to argue that there's some value from patients' perspectives, but the, the process should be con context sensitive. The functions that consent plays really are, I think, different in these settings, um, and there's a big reg regulatory gap. There are a lot of considerations other than just whether people understand and whether we've effectively transferred information that I think are relevant. Um, and this opportunity to object, I think, is a good area for some further work. Most importantly, I think, in this, in this group, I, I think it's, it's a nice example of ways that integrating ethics research can, can start to get at an evidence base for how we do things that we do. So I acknowledge sort of folks that have helped to support this research and a large team of people um, who have worked with me on different elements of this. Um, it's been a really interesting process and, and hopefully an area where we can make some improvements. Great. Uh, well, uh, thanks. And so I was invited to be a discussant, and I'm not entirely sure what that meant, but I'm going to give it a try. I've come up with a couple of a couple of thoughts and comments on that. So first off, I thought I should reintroduce myself. So I'm a physician here in emergency medicine, um, and all of my work is in cardiac arrest and post-arrest care, which is an area which, of course, uh, is very impacted upon by ethics, uh, consent, ethic regulations, these sorts of issues. So this is sort of near and dear to my heart, but I should point out as a caveat, I have no formal ethics training. Uh, uh, I try to be ethical, but that's about as close as I come to anything related. So I'm certainly not an expert in this area. Um, but a couple of thoughts from our experience, and, and I should tell you, we've had a lot of experience here at Penn in ethic research, uh, in cardiac arrest, and trauma, and other areas. I'm certainly happy to share with you some of those uh, trials, because some of them may be fantastic areas for research for some of you. I, I imagine some of you are grad students, um, masters, or PhD students. And since there have been a number of acute care trials underway at Penn, uh, I could imagine building on ancillary studies much like have been described uh, with some of the work that we've done locally. So come talk to me if that's an area of interest. A couple of thoughts on the talk. First of all, fantastic work, and I think this is really important work. And if, if you needed um, uh, some justification for why this isn't just an academic issue, uh, it's important for all of us to recognize that critical uh, illness and critically ill patients are sort of a burgeoning, growing problem in the United States. You know, we're getting very good at taking care of the simple stuff. So uh, uh, the burden of critical illness is growing in the U.S. and around the world, and therefore the burden of figuring out solutions for the critically ill is growing as well. And so I think how we handle trials and ethics around enrollment for these patients is, is really not just an academic issue, but a very important practical issue if we're to move medical care forward. 
couple of uh, thoughts on, on the presentation. Uh, it was interesting to see the results uh, from some of these surveys of folks enrolled in these trials in, in the PCARE study and, and such. I think one challenging thing uh, that some of you might consider in, in other work is to consider talking to the folks who didn't enroll. You know, it's an, an important bias here, and, and by necessity, uh, patients were engaged who had taken part in trials. Obviously, this is a very hard proposition to put forth, but I challenge us to think that we should also study folks who refuse trials. And, and uh, perhaps we should ask them, well, wh you know, at some later point, why didn't you enroll? You know, for example, it was interesting to note that um, patients reported they didn't feel pressured. Um, I suspect that was part of the reason why they actually enrolled. Uh, in that, you have to understand consent is a transaction. It's a human transaction where someone's selling and someone's buying, really. I mean, let's, let's sort of be blunt about it. And so perhaps um, there's a bias there in that many folks who are turned down may have been put off by someone who's being pushy. Oh, you really got to do this. This is really important. We have to make a decision now. A natural human reaction by some may be to say, I'm out. I want nothing to do with this. Um, and, and that may be an important uh, aspect to this. So I think we should try as best we can to study folks who refuse consent as well. So that's just one thought um, um, from that and, and from ongoing work. The other point I would make is that the central IRB concept was raised um, briefly. And for those who aren't aware, this is a growing trend in many areas of collaborative research, but certainly in acute care and critical care research, where there are um, organizations that serve as an IRB of record for multiple sites. And, and I personally, perhaps I'm biased, but I personally think this is a good direction to take. Um, an analogy I would offer is it's much like uh, uh, having national guidelines for care that dictate care at a number of hospitals being better than every hospital coming up with its own care guidelines for how to say, take care of someone in a trauma or a STEMI. I'll take trauma, I was inspired, I saw Pat Riley here, so trauma came to mind. Um, there's ATLS, there's a course of study and a methodology for how we handle trauma that is national and everyone as ascribes to that. Imagine the converse of that where every hospital came up with its own method of managing trauma. Um, we, we wouldn't want that for our patients or ourselves. And similarly, I think to ask every hospital to have its own IRB to think through complex thorny ethical issues when this isn't really necessarily what they do full time. Um, many people who serve on IRBs sort of do it as, a, as we know, sort of on the side. Um, whereas central IRBs can really sort of focus and then we can all sing from the same hymnal. So, so I think central IRBs are going to be a very important way to move forward, especially with some of these more thorny areas of consent. And then finally, I thought I'd throw out sort of a, a, a challenge to all of us, um, which really was inspired by the, the slide deck. You heard that in a way, there's two flavors of consent in a way, ethic and full consent. And that's historically been th the way it's done. Um, so it's sort of one size fits all, or two sizes fits all, if you will. Well, one of the big trends, uh, as you all know, in modern medicine is towards precision medicine, or tailored care. You know, this has come about with pharmacogenomics and other sort of ways of looking at patients' genotypes and phenotypes to say maybe one therapy for all patients doesn't make sense. Um, this has really had a big impact, for example, in cancer therapeutics. Well, maybe, just maybe we need to think of precision medical consent. That is, we need to think about phenotypes of patients or phenotypes of studies for which one form of consent is appropriate and another isn't. And, and so we need to fill in this gray area between ethic and full consent. And the only way to do it, I think, is through some of the work um, that's been described to really push these boundaries and, and show through evidence space to IRBs, central IRBs and regulatory bodies that there is room for finding specific approaches to consent that fill this space. And, and so maybe one day we'll have a whole field of sort of precision ethics or precision medical consent that mirrors precision therapeutics. Um, so maybe I'll stop there with those comments and maybe both of us can take questions. Okay, sure. So. I'd like to take one second to, to just, I guess, mostly just agree with everything Ben said, but especially with regard to interviewing refusers, um, this is, uh, for most of us in this field, it's like the holy grail of, of research ethics is to talk to people who say no, uh, and figuring out how to do that well is something really important to do. One interesting thing about the emergency research space is, at least in some domains, the number of people who refuse is actually quite low. Um, it's strikingly, you know, I, I looked at this sort of study of uh, 
There was an antiplatelet study the other day that was a, a pre-hospital pre study of antiplatelet um, administration, and the you know, acceptance rate was 98%, right? which you never see in any study where any kind of normal consent process takes place. And so it is, it, I, in, some, in some studies, it's, uh, it's quite low, but I, I couldn't reiterate more the importance of talking to people who say no. We just need to figure out the right way to do it. Yeah. So I'll, I'll um, I promise I didn't plant him. Um, so that's a really great question. So one of the things that our panel just had a hard time getting past was how angry the financial compensation section of a typical consent form makes them. So not, we're not talking about paying people for participating in research. We're talking about sort of who's going to get stuck with the bill. So most institutions have language in consent forms that say something like, there may or may not be charges. You'll, insurance will get billed. You, they may or may not pay. You may or may not get a bill. And, and it's another, it's a perfect example of this. this. This scares the mess out of me and tells me nothing at the same time. Um, we had almost no ability. Those are institutional policy issues, right, in terms of how they get operationalized. So it wasn't an area that we had much space to make improvements on. But it was an area that, at least for them, they keyed in on almost every time they looked at a consent form. Um, and anecdotally, I know of, I, know, you know, I've, I had a conversation recently with one of our neurocritical care researchers, and he's like, they keep getting to this financial section. <laughs> and maybe Emory's is just really bad. Um, he's like, they keep getting to this, um, and, and, and we get all these questions that we, in truth, don't know how to answer. And, and, and often the answer is it usually gets worked out, don't really worry about it. And we all know most of the time that probably is the case, but, but how to communicate that is really a challenge. By the way, I'll add a little thought. Um, those of you looking for project healthcare, I think this is an interesting line of inquiry to do with follow up with patients from rules and two case studies, find out about their experiences with the bills yeah. um, and, and payment. Because, you know, Say, let's take every other model, you know, standard consent for chemotherapy, how many times going. There's sort of very standard, well developed ways that patients are marked as study patients, and really prospectively sort of payments and bills can be apportioned correctly. I suspect, also knowing very little about this, really, I suspect when patients are enrolled in two case studies, you know, the first 12 to 24 hours is really data from the patient designation, from the charting, from the documents you want to use. And I wouldn't be surprised if the lag of dealing with bills after and people after which is environment. I wouldn't be surprised if it's a lot worse if you're doing this study because insurance doesn't, doesn't know you're a study patient and the health says, well, you're a study patient, it's not on us. And, and this would be an interesting experience to delve into about patients yeah. after an acute care hospitalization web enrollment, whether this really like hurt them um, or, or caused enormous confusion to them. Because I actually don't know. Yeah. And I suspect the answer is. It'll be very just, just there. Yeah. That's right. Really variable. 
It's, it's one I, of the reasons it's very difficult to be clear about, right? It's well, very. <clears throat> yeah, my Yeah, so um, <clears throat> it's a great question. So the ethic regulations, I can, in a sense, try to do that. Uh, so <clears throat> they try to, I wouldn't say they cap the risk, but they try to ensure a certain risk-benefit ratio by the sort of life-threatening condition requirement, which I don't know what Ben's views on, but I think is largely unhelpful because the, you know, there are a lot of things that don't threaten life that are important to study. Um, the, exist, the fact that existing treatment has to be inadequate, it's, it's, it, the language is that it has to be unsatisfactory or unproven. Um, there has to be a prospect of direct benefit, appropriate risk-benefit ratio. It's not very specific as to how it restricts it, but the notion is this should be, this should be uh, important, um, it should be an, uh, a serious issue, and you shouldn't impose people to too much, uh, you shouldn't impose too much risk on people. So, in a, so one of the things that I would say, at the very least, part of the problem with fragmentation is most of these things get done under sort of full consent, um, a full consent framework, but we don't think about the fact that an, a patient with an acute MI, I don't know that I'm any more justified exposing him to a risk as I would be to someone having cardiac arrest or something. You know, the fact that they said yes doesn't necessarily mean that they've, they've signed on to the risk of the study. And so I think from an IRB's perspective, probably the real implication is, I don't, I don't know about any sort of clear risk limitations, but you ought to think about it in a very similar way. And I think um, it, it, we tend to kind of channel things into one pathway or the other. So I do think that, I, I think that could be meaningful. Ben, I don't know if you have. Um. Yeah, I mean, I think one more general point I would make is that. Um, oh, there we go. Ethics regulations. Even though that is so Ethics regulations uh, were an important response. Yeah. Thanks for trying. We really didn't want to hear what you had to say. Ethics regulations were an important response to the need, which is the need to have a framework to be reasonable and figure out what it's going to take for the research in a way That said, um, I think many of us feel that there um, need some work. Uh, and, and you know, it's, it's sort of a tricky issue because um, they were put out there. Um, uh, they've largely been untouched since their original inception. 96. Years ago, yeah. yeah. Years ago, or longer, I guess. Um, and uh, uh, it's sort of a difficult issue to poke. Um, people don't want to think about, you know, is it involved sort of the federal bureaucracy um, putting time and investment into thinking about safeguarding patients or rather, in many ways, in their view of the law? You can imagine that this gets political, this gets challenging. Nonetheless, I would suggest that the current rules and regulations that govern us Many of them just don't kind of make sense yeah. in what we do. So they're very imperfect. Um, they were set in the right direction, uh, but it, it, in the ideal world, they would be updated and modified with some yeah. frequency. We can put the research in the process. Yeah, I, I think that's exactly right. I remember a conversation I had a couple of years ago with Mike Weisfeld, who was very involved in actually helping to push these forward, which in 96, they were put in place after essentially all research in emergency settings was shut down. 
Um, and, and when you start to talk about the idea of expanding ethic and having more, you know, you get this sort of look like, are you serious? You don't know how hard we worked to make these, to get these regulations into place. So if I start talking about putting them in the acute MI context, and maybe you have an opt-out process kind of lumped in, there's a real worry that, that, that you start to jeopardize the ability to do really important research. And, and, and I, I think the concern is valid, whether there are ways to, to, to grow it is, um, uh, is a challenge. The other piece that's really this, the, the unsatisfactory, unproven requirement is probably the, the, the one that is arguably either the most restrictive or the dumbest, right? It says you can only do a study when existing therapy is unsatisfactory or unproven. If you're really rigorous about that, it would mean you can't ever do comparative studies of existing therapies, or you just say absolutely nothing is perfectly satisfactory, perfectly satisfactory or perfectly proven, in which case the requirement does absolutely nothing, which I guess is probably the better way to interpret it, but. All right, we've reached the hour. Thanks, everybody, for coming in. Thanks.